what I think every humanist writer who, who steps into war, who is not, you know, Hamas and Hezbollah and ISIS and Nazis and Stalinist communists and, and the rest of it, are people who recognize that at, at base what survives and what is meant to survive is our humanity is our shared humanity, our universal humanity. If there's anything truly worth fighting for, it's the assurance that that is going to have a chance to persist so that we collectively can work throughout those differences. Hi, everyone. This is AJ Woodhams host of the War Books Podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Today, I am really excited to have on the show Derek B. Miller for his new book, The Curse of Pietro Houdini. Derek is an international affairs expert and the author of six previous novels, Norwegian by Night, The Girl in Green, American by Day, Radio Life, Quiet Time, and How to Find Your Way in the Dark. His work has been shortlisted for many awards, with Norwegian by Night winning the CWA John Creasy Dagger Award for Best First Crime Novel. How to Find Your Way in the Dark was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award and a New York Times Best Mystery of 2021. Derek, how are you doing today? I'm delighted to be here. It's an unexpected pleasure, yeah. so thanks for inviting me. No, thank you. And uh, your book is is right up my alley. The, the first question that I like authors to start off answering is if in your own words, can you just tell me what is your book about? Yeah, that's always, I mean, I anticipated you'd ask me that. And it's always a tricky question, right? Because there's the theme and there's the plot. And in some ways, I think the theme of the book is it's about at the broadest, most abstract level, it's probably about transformations, about how we see things one way that in that when that when experience becomes something else. And there's and I was thinking about Ovid's Metamorphosis at the time and how all of the, all of the art in this book that, that's uh, mentioned is inspired by Titian or Tiziano, was inspired by um, Ovid's Metamorphosis and, Mavis, and Metamorphosis, of course, is transformation. And each one of the paintings that's mentioned is captures a moment in time about about transformation. And so there's, there is something about catching that moment when we expected the world to be one way, but we pulled the curtain aside and found something else entirely and in turn have to become something else entirely in order to attend to what we've discovered. And it is something that happens more and more in adulthood when you find that what you thought was going to be forever isn't anymore or what you thought was true isn't when you have to question something or when the world just conspires against you and and uh and circumstances force you to into another life that you uh that you weren't expecting death does that divorce does that all kinds of things can do that war does that obviously um many things do and uh but I guess when it comes to plot, but that's not a sales point. Nobody wants to pick up and read a book about transformation unless you're in the market for Ovid. So uh, it's about uh, it's about a 14 year old child uh, who uh, flees the Allied bombing of Rome in 1943. Parents are killed. Mix makes it south as far as Casino, which is you know going going down Italy into the Liri Valley. Ends up getting beaten up near uh, at the base of uh, of Monte Cassino, which is where the Abbey of Monte Cassino is, which was built by Saint Benedict in uh, 529 A.D. on the ruins of the Temple of Apollo, and it has a commanding valley of a uh, commanding view rather of the and position uh, of the Liri Valley, which in a very short time the uh the allies are going to have to advance up and through in order to be able to make their way to rome and it is where the germans are digging in in what is what is the effectively the winter line which goes right across kind of the knee of italy and the abbey of monte cassino is located right on that line and is the most commanding place on it and it is a remarkable venue 
for a story that is ultimately an art heist, a coming of age story, a survival story, and uh, a historical novel, and um, what may be a contradiction in terms, but I don't think so, is literary suspense. And so, uh, so it is. It is it is drama and it is comedy and drama and tragedy and the whole kit and caboodle. I think. Yeah. Which, well, <laughs> you, part of what we were and we were we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording is is your background is not just fiction. You are a, an an international affairs professional. Uh, I don't. Would you consider yourself a historian? No, I think of historians as having a very particular training, particularly with an intellectual focus, with backgrounds in historiography, so they know how, what they're getting into and how they're approaching it, and dealing with various specific problems that the writing of history directs you to. I'm a political scientist, so I have a master's in national security. I have a second master's degree in political science and a PhD in international relations. And in the course of doing that, all that, my expertise becomes in research design and, and wondering about a question of history or about international affairs, and then building out the research design to question, how would I, how would I investigate that? What would an answer to that look like? How do I study it? Whereas historians, not to, and historians have problems with political scientists, political scientists have problems with historians. I think the best political scientists uh, appreciate- Is that right? The, is there a, the there's a tension between the two? Yeah, because political history, the basic argument that historian will make, and they're not necessarily wrong, is that political scientists treat history as what they call a Procrustean bed. Right. So the story of Procrustes from Greek mythology is if he had a rack and if you were too long, he'd lop off your feet. And if you were too short, he'd stretch you. So in other words, either way, you're going to fit. And the historian will complain about the political scientist that the political scientist will look at the world and will eventually fit the world to fit the model, fit the rack because they come at the world with a certain perspective, a certain ideology, a certain interpretive framework. And as a result of that, they tend to not deal with the nuance because they're so interested in building theory. The political scientist, in turn, will say, I'm glad that you recorded all that, but what's the conclusion? What does it mean? What are you going to say? What are we going to learn from it? And they're like, and historian doesn't, will often find them timid and they'll find them, you know, this is, and I think both of these are, are wrong because the best yeah. people are drawing from each other. Simply the best yeah. people in any field are drawing from each other. But as a graduate student, it is necessary to work through those, to understand what those tensions are and work through them, to understand that they do come from someplace and you don't want to be one of the people who's a lousy historian or a lousy political scientist, yeah. of which well, there are too many on all sides. <laughs> well, thank you for that uh, that distinction. Uh, and My for all you historians. All you historians out there, I hope you have not flipped off the episode and now knowing that uh, no, that, this is not this is not an anti this, this is not an anti history argument. On the contrary, well, my uh, my what I was getting at with my question actually, even though we went, went down a little bit of a rabbit hole, is you have you, yeah. you have a lot of interest. You have a very varied background. Yeah. Your last book, I believe, was a, a science fiction book. Well, uh, is that correct? Yeah, well, two books came out at the same time because of COVID. Uh, COVID was not good to writers. That's uh, um, not to say that we got the worst, but we didn't get away with, with much. Um, so two of my novels came out at the same time. One was Radio Life, which was is an epic, sweeping, uh, post-apocalyptic story about civilization rebuilding itself rather than its collapse. And But that technically came out prior to How to Find Your Way in the Dark, which was... Uh, historical fiction mystery uh, set between 1937 and 47. It's a, a big coming of age story. That's the one that was shortlisted for the National Jewish Book Award. Yeah. Well, so, what? But I mean, you know, I'm happy to talk about whatever you want. I mean, I wrote them all. No, no, no. Like, well, I was just going to ask, you know, why, why this book? Why did you choose to write this book? Um, what was it that interested you about Pietro this particular Houdini? moment in history? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, Pietro Houdini came about 
not all books come about in interesting ways. Sometimes you just, anybody who does art knows that stuff comes from all over the place. But, but Pietro Houdini came about because I had, because of Radio Life, which was my science fiction novel, um, which sounds like a stretch, but bear with me a second. Um, but wait, there's more. Uh, it goes like this. There was a novel written in 1959, or at least published in 1959, by Walter Miller Jr. called A Canticle for Leibowitz. A Canticle for Leibowitz won the Hugo Award and I think also the Nebula, but I have to check. These are some of the highest science fiction awards they give in, in, uh, in English. And it was the only... I believe it was the only novel he actually published in his lifetime, or at least complete novel. There was something at the end, which was kind of a sequel, but this was it. He had written a couple of short stories and it was a huge seller. It was a magnificent story, but it was very, very, very pessimistic. And the, in a word, in this post-apocalyptic environment, after what he called the flame deluge, there's this abbey, that has is somehow still clinging on it's not even catholic anymore it's it's something and it records whatever tiny little bits of this is pre-internet pre-electronic era as we know it today pre-digital if you know what i mean and so the libraries are gone everything's gone the maps are gone and they find tiny little scraps of things they find in the world and they and they copy them for posterity not knowing what they are what they could mean how they're connected and, and, and this is the story of how that small act, in a way, ends up leading to the recreation of nuclear weapons, which end up blowing up the Abbey. And it was published in 1959. I'm sorry for giving it away, but you had your time. Okay? <laughs> so, but the thing is, Walter Miller Jr. was a... Was a uh, was on the bombing runs during World War II that destroyed the Abbey of Monte Cassino, which, as I mentioned earlier, was built, or I think I mentioned earlier, because I talked to you a moment or two before, was built in uh, 529 AD. So this is where all monastic life in Christendom began. Quite literally, I don't mean that in a figurative sense. It started there with him and Benedictine uh, Benedict's rules, and to destroy something like that, and then later to find out that four hundred civilians were were uh, were hiding there. Not to mention the actual abbot of Gregory was was there at the time as well, who somehow survived. More bombs were dropped on the Abbey of Monte Cassino than on any other single structure in all of World War II. And if you take a moment to consider just how much we wanted to bomb during World War II and how many bombs were dropped, I'm not talking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki because it didn't target a particular site, right? It, it picked an area, right? Not to be dismissive of the harm done, but but I mean, it's, it's, it's not the same thing. They bombed a building to, to ash, let alone rubble. And he was one of the bombers on that. And I kept thinking about his and the story of this thing. And he flew over 25 missions, which I'm sure everyone who listens to this pod, this your podcast, whatnot, will, will know what that means. It's, you know, your chance of dying were high. You weren't supposed to do that and, and the rest of it. And, and, you know, you take off to a, to sight unknown, you destroy everything about it and you fly back. It's linear or the equivalent of there, back, there, back, there, back, 25 times or more. And you obliterate things. You never see the consequences really of what you've done. You've never really seen the harm. This isn't like being an infantry soldier. And it is no surprise to me, not to, I don't like pop psychology, but, but one can't help but sense the, the linearity, the, the destructiveness, the inevitability, the the sense of impending doom maybe even a touch of nihilism but not complete nihilism because you wouldn't be harmed by the world if you didn't still care about it i think people who are truly nihilistic are beyond 
the realm of sympathy and empathy. And this is a man who clearly was not by virtue of not only the beauty of his writing, but the pain that, that was in the story. So anyway, it's a good book. So I wrote, I see another way. I had another, I wanted to write a non a science fiction novel that was in a sense, not an homage to that novel, not a sequel to that novel, because that's absurd, but a book that I felt would be in dialogue with that novel. Not because I wanted to take on the same story, but rather because I think there are other ways of getting through this. I don't, I'm not as, I'm not as gloomy and he eventually did commit suicide as, as he is. I wouldn't call myself chipper, but I would still say that there are, there's still, I saw an, I saw the same observations that he made in the world as a professional who studies war and security and whatnot, but I saw another way out. And so I wanted to write a story that started from the same premise, but ended in a different place. But the thing is, is that at, even after writing Radio Life, I wasn't done. There was still something about, because the Abbey was just so beckoning as a venue and a location, and it was so mysterious. And, and I hadn't seen an Abbey in a novel that had captured anyone's attention really since the name of the rose and which don't quote me on this, but it's easy to look up. It's around 81 maybe or something. We can Google it later, but I'm, I'm not, I'm close enough for, you know, horseshoes and hand grains. So um, point is it's, it's been a while, not to say that the world every so often needs a, an Abbey at the center of a novel, but it just, it really captured my, my imagination and I wanted to visit it. And I think what happens with a lot of people who write historical fiction, and I know this happens with historians and it happens with people who have an intellectual commitment to something and they dive in, not knowing as you reconnoiter what you're gonna find. And then you just find the coolest stuff and you just can't believe how interesting it is. And you've had this conversation 49 times now. You know that every single time a historian Dives into 49. Some, right, 49. Ta -da! Okay, you could have, <laughs> I could have been 50 if only you'd had a little patience. But um, <laughs> I'm kidding. But every historian who will, will have a, a disturbance in the force. They know there's something in that archive, something in that story, and they dive down, and all of a sudden, this universe of fascinating stuff comes out of it. And, and you, you know this is true, that what I'm saying is right, because you find historians with the most obscure passions you know the history of cod and they just want to grab you by the lapels and tell you how your life will never be complete until you understand the joy and nuance and richness of what they have encountered in their study of fish or <laughs> helicopters or internal combustion engines or whatever it is they've got them all ramped up which is why i think they're fun I think they're, I mean, it's nerdy fun, but it's, but it's fun. And so this, when I started pressing on it, a universe of, 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 of tragedy and possibility and mysticism and other things it came out. And my job as a writer or as it was to, as it was fiction, right? A novelist was not to become overwhelmed and swamped by, by, by what was unleashed by finding this sort of treasure trove of material, but rather to find a story within it that would become the vehicle for allowing me to bring in that which is interesting about it and create uh, a moment of drama that would attract us, attract me, because it, you know you can plow through this and you know in ten hours I got to stick with the darn thing for eighteen months, right or longer. <laughs> and so I mean it has to it has to and it has to capture my attention for that long, and it absolutely did. And I needed a I needed a story that could bring all that together. And it took me a while to find it, but then I, I think I did. But now's the big moment where. Somebody else has to read it and tell me what they think. So here we are. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about your your main characters in this book. First, uh, Massimo. Could you just talk a little bit about um, Massimo? Um, what what kind of character is he? What kind of person is he? And what, what kind of role does he play in this story? There's Massimo's a 14-year-old Italian kid from Rome. 
And Massimo has, in a story of transformation, Massimo has a, a secret identity, which whenever I say a secret identity, I can't help but think of the Incredibles. But, but in this case, Massimo has a secret identity. But Pietro Houdini has a secret identity because nobody in Italy is actually named Houdini because it's not an Italian word. It was made up by Harry Houdini, whose name was also not Harry Houdini. And that's, I'll, I'll let that one go, but we can circle back if it, if it amuses you. Massimo is, the, the story begins with this character, unnamed, who's roughly 50 years old or so, an adult, a proper adult. Uh, and the story begins and ends with this person's narration of, uh, of going into the story, recounting it, and coming out of it. So obviously alive. Massimo becomes the, is the innocent through which this story is experienced and expressed. But it is not a young adult novel. Too many people these days think that if there's a teenager in there, somehow it's a young adult novel. I assure you it's not, though your teenagers are welcome to read it. And uh, tough though it can be for the younger one. So I would, this is more of a 16 plus kind of situation. But in any event, um, Massimo's story is a survival story during war. So it is a, it is a, it is, there's a difference a profound difference between running away from something and running towards something. And Massimo at the beginning of the book is running away from, from, uh, from Rome, trying to get to Naples. And in the course of this, in the course of a series of, of personal transformations and revelations for us as, as readers, we come to understand what it means to survive and different strategies and ways of surviving in fascist Italy and then basically German occupied Italy, which historians will know that that's a complicated phrase, but work with me here. And then eventually allied either occupied or liberated Italy, <laughs> depending on you know, how you're, how you're going to look at it. Right. You know, so um, it's, it's all a bit tricky there. So Massimo becomes is our eyes and ears and narrator of of this of this giant adventure in a sense that takes mm -hmm. a year mm -hmm. to play out. Well, let's talk then a little bit about Pietro Houdini. Um, uh, who is he and what's his role? Pietro is somebody who introduces himself as a an art restorer and a confidant of the Vatican who has been sent to the Abbey of Monte Cassino to help with the preservation of the Abbey's art and mosaics in a time of crisis. And Pietro is lying. But about what and why? And yet he is extraordinarily learned. He has very little interest in facts, but seems to have a profound dedication to the truth. And, and Pietro is trying to get to Naples, and we don't know why. And the only way to Naples is on the route, which is basically Route 6 through the Leary Valley, the only meaningful way that you can get there. There are but the problem, as I mentioned earlier, is the Allies are coming up, the Germans are digging in, and at some point you, you're going to have to, the, the wave, you know, is, is going to break. And you know that the wave is going to break here. So the question is, can you, can you get out, you know, to the break, through the breakwaters of the war? Uh, because there really is no way to get around it. And so Pietro and Massimo form this strange little alliance. And this, this, this connection is magnetic and it attracts these other characters, uh, a monk, uh, somebody who seems to be a nurse that has it in for the Germans, a, uh, a woman who is a cafe, ran a cafe and a restaurant who has secrets of her own and gets the whole 
turns the whole situation upside down. These two lovers, one of them is a, uh, a, a, a the woman's a flute player from the eastern coast in Bari, and and her boyfriend was uh, an Italian soldier who was forced uh, to serve in uh, in Greece, and and so or Albania, and you have the this this motley cast of characters, motley crew of characters, if you will, end up becoming attracted to this energy and life of Pietro Houdini, who is, as I said, some kind of larger than life character who that some is there are people who are in negotiation with their times. And while it's the, this, the sentence is hackneyed and it's not exactly what we're talking about. There's the old line of, you know, of, uh, you know, great, great men aren't born, they're made, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and the times create great leaders and all this sort of thing. But there's something, there's something more interesting than that underneath that sort of hackneyed observation, which is that our, it's more about how our metal is tested as individuals in, in, in crisis. And it could be, it could be, it could be any kind of crisis. It could be, it could be cancer. It could be war. It could be the loss of a loved one. It could be, but it is crisis. And it, it is, and, and we are, and we become tested. And when we become tested, we are in, we, our character as it were, is in negotiation with whatever these stresses of the world are around us. And, and that negotiated space changes us. I guess a space can't change you, but you know what I mean? It's, it's a bad metaphor, but that doesn't undermine my point, which is that we are, it is in that arena in which, in which we, um, we become more than we were or less. It is, we don't always rise to the occasion. I mean, there is also, there is also cowardice and deception and, and, uh, and, and all other kind the whole range of human experience, but is more brought to bear at moments of challenge, which is why. I, th I think there's, I think people who are attracted to, to books about war, unless you're weird, aren't really attracted to the war part. I think there are a certain group of people who are, and they're not my favorite people. What I find are the people who are most attracted to it are trying to understand the human condition under stress. And war is about as direct as it can get. And unlike, and you can see this from the disaster movies, you know, it's, it's not man against, right. Well, who was it? I don't, I don't think it was Whitman. I can't remember who it was. Man against man, man against nature and man against himself. These are the you know, gender issues, notwithstanding. These are your three main themes. And I think there's, you know, I, I think the one that's missing is man against God. And, and we can credit, you know, George Bernard Shaw and his comments about, uh, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Casanova. But anyway, there's a, there is those three or four themes are the big, big themes, but you know, man against wave, man against giant rock, man against tornado, you know, it's not quite the same thing as what it means for us for conflicting ideas of the good to clash or good against evil to clash if it's more operatic to, and to see what that does to us. And so I, I think that people who are interested in war novels are very interested in what it means. I think they're interested in humanity, I guess is what I'm trying yeah. to say. I think right. you're, you know, I think you're absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, something that comes up time and again on this show is, well, for one, for me, your books about war, stories about war, you're, you're exactly right. It's often people who are just normal people who are put into extraordinary situations where they're they're forced to make choices that you know you or I would not be forced to make. I mean we would if we were in that situation but you know it's it's a test often of especially in the context of World War II it's a test of our humanity, you know, it's a test of our you know our our courage and our morality. So so you're you're absolutely right about that I think. Uh, I, I'm curious you know, we've been talking about transformation and I'm, I'm curious when you're writing characters who are put in these situations where, you know, you've got to make very uh, difficult choices 
or you're operating in a moral gray zone and you're writing about those characters, I'm curious how you personally might have changed as a person from when you started this story to when you ended this story. It's an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, we, I, I don't remember who said that, you know, every time a writer, every time a novel is published, it's like one step closer to death. You know, it's just, it's, it is a, it is, it is a brutal <clears throat> um, process. There's, there's a lot of ways of answering that. And in the interest of time, I, I guess I have to pick one, but I mean, one way to answer that is as a writer, uh, as a novelist, each of my projects is different. This is true for most people. Well, that's not true. For, I don't think it's true for Lee Child. I think he knows what he's, he knows yeah. what he's doing. Well, I he's saw a great guy. Book, by the way. He's, yes, he's a great guy. He said nice things about me. God bless him. And, 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 and Jack Reacher, uh, obviously. But I think when, I think when he writes a novel, it's, it's going to be pretty similar to his last novel. And he knows kind of what he's getting into. Whereas when Ian McEwen or, or, or Kate Atkinson or, uh, uh, gosh, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, Jonathan Franzen or uh, uh, Michael Chabon, uh, you know, I think uh, Joyce Carol Oates, uh, Margaret Atwood, when these people are writing books, uh, Ish Ishiguru, um, I don't think they have any idea what, I haven't asked each of them in, in turn, but each of their books is very different from their other books. Their voices are the same, their, 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 their philosophies, their consciousness, their, their character, their skills, all of that, all of that appears on the page. So, you know, one, one Margaret Atwood book will feel like another Margaret Atwood book, but these are people who pick very, very different themes, right? You know, Wonder Boys is not the same thing as uh, the Yiddish Policeman's Union, right? It's just, it's a different thing, right? Uh, uh, Ian McEwan's Saturday is just not the same book as on Chisel Beach or, or, or whatever, if I'm, you know, and, uh, Ishiguru is another one, you know, I mean, you know, uh, anyway, I could go on, but the point is each of these more, more sort of top shelf literary writers, uh, uh, which as pretentious as that sounds, you know, I'm in that general category, or at least that they're beating me with a stick and forcing me into that category. Each of the books is different. And so what happens is, is that, it's very unfamiliar ground every single time. You don't know what you're getting into. Different novels have different time. This is getting into the nuts and bolts. This is like musicians talk more like this than writers. But for those of you who are still here, you know, one book might have a, uh, a four day time span, right? Uh, Aristotle says that's about how long a thriller should be. He didn't use the word thriller, obviously, but he pretty much says, if you want to hold the reader's attention, that's pretty much what you're talking about, three or four days. I believe that I think he got that from the Iliad, which, though it talks about 10 years, is set only over three or four days. Um, most adventure, most your basic Jane, your basic what Jason Bourne adventure is going to be set over, you know, to, you know, or, you know, if you remember what the TV show 24 you know, I don't know if you're old enough to remember that, but it's, you know, that was, you know. Well, I believe the, the creator of that wrote the Vince Flynn thriller series books. I could be mixing this up, but the creator of I that was actually a very successful author. Yeah, it's, well, it's, there is, it was good storytelling. It was a lot of fun. But, you know, you, you're either four days or it could be a year. The, the, How to Find Your Way in Dark was set over 10 years, which changed me. This book was... Where a book like The Girl in Green ended up being very cathartic, this book was an unexpected encounter with things that I really thought I should have known, but I didn't. So I was listening to one of your uh, uh, shows, and it was with your former teacher at your MFA, Salar Ab Abdul. Salar. Okay. Yeah. And one thing that he said, this is for those interested, this was episode 34, okay? He was talking about his novel out of Mesopotamia. And one thing that he said beautifully, and um, to make sure that I quoted him, because I couldn't agree with him more, and this is more true for The Girl in Green for me, but was clearly true for him here. And I think both of us had the same, because I worked for the United Nations for 10 years. I've been in conflict zones and other things. I haven't had the same life he's had, obviously. But I've, I've been to, you know, I've been to Yemen and Sierra Leone, and I've, I've been around the block. <laughs> And he said at one point, because you were, you didn't ask him this exactly, but this is basically what you asked him, which is why are you writing this as fiction? I'm paraphrasing. But his, his quote was, 
I couldn't fit that insanity into the straitjacket of nonfiction. And that's exactly right. I mean, there's too much absurdity, even comedy, which he explicitly talked about, in the craziness of this, this crucible of war, that trying to get the breadth of that out through merely nonfiction, I know that sounds crazy, but is was impossible. And he needed, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm basically repeating what he said, so I don't need to put yeah. words in his mouth, but you were there, is he yeah. needed that larger palette, that larger space in order to, and the possible range, the possible dramatic range in order to be able to experience that. It's exactly how I feel. That's definitely how I felt with The Girl in Green, and it's definitely how I felt with another war book, which is this, which is The Curse of Pietro Houdini. And because, weirdly, this stuff can be very, very funny. And I know that sound... Now, some of it is obviously very dark humor, but it isn't black humor. It isn't making fun of death. It isn't making fun of pain. It isn't making fun of suffering. It is recognizing that there is a... I don't know if you've ever experienced something like this, but just to to end the answer to this question in the only way that I can, I have I've often heard people saying that they 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 experience God during moments of of crisis, and I feel that that's not what happens with me. I feel that when I'm in a moment of crisis, I'm alone, and I'm dealing with it alone, and I'm going to deal with it alone. If I get through it, it's going to be alone. It's during moments of absurdity, that's when I, my eyes roll up to heaven because I can't believe I'm the only one seeing this. That's when I need a second witness. That's when I feel that, that God is most necessary. You know, if yeah. only to be, so I am not the only witness to insanity. Surely somebody else is getting this. And that kind of that kind of that feeling, even if you don't, you don't have to agree with it, understand, believe in this or that. I'm not converting anybody in anything. It's, but that impetus to be like, you know, where you want, where you look at the dog and the dog looks back at you because you're the only two intelligent things here. Did you know? I mean, right this with the, you know, in the camera. I mean, I feel like this is the essence of Jewish comedy right here because you know, which I I trace back as a Jew to Abraham having the conversation with, with God, who's about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And I just kind of picture it. It's very Mel Brooksy, but, you know, sitting there going, you know, you know, God saying Gomorrah and Abraham going, yeah, what a mess. And God goes, yeah, I think I'm just going to wipe it out. And Abraham going, yeah, wait, wait, you're, you're what, you know, I mean, which, which has got to be the first recorded double take, right? you know but but what if there's a hundred good people well all right if there's a hundred good people what about uh, 50 you know working your way down eventually god loses his patience at 10 apparently so there's that story well but, you're so you're you're so right about and it's so interesting you bring up solar who really one of my favorite war writers that knowing that you want to say something about just a, a really trying time in human history, but trying to figure out how is that, how is, how is what I want to say about that moment in history? How is that best told? That's and right. For you. Yeah. And, and for you, it, it's through fiction. Solar is through fiction. I interviewed a, an author named Phil Clay and he's written both nonfiction and fiction war writing. He, he has tremendous uh, books about war that, that have really moved me in a lot of ways. And his most recent book we had this discussion like, well, what, you know, why? Because he wrote a nonfiction book, but the, the book before that was fiction. I was like, why nonfiction? Yeah. And he's like, that's just what the story was. That's what the story needed. It, it right. needed a nonfiction lens, you know, through which to to tell this story. So that's that's really interesting that, um, that, that you feel the same way. And I'm glad you brought that yeah. up. Fiction and nonfiction are each different kinds of instruments. And where I find... Mm -hmm. There's a, and I know don't want to make a I don't want to make a, a grand sweeping uh, theory about this, but as a first pass anyway, something worth discussing is that is that any nonfiction book or most nonfiction books in any event done well are in a sense building towards an argument. 
right? That doesn't mean that they have started with an argument. It means that in the course, a, a good historian, a good, a good thinker isn't, isn't doing the Procrustean bed. Rather, they, but they come to an understanding of, of something which is either, generally speaking, fills a gap in our knowledge or corrects an error in it. Right. And truly great people can do both or possibly create an entirely new way of seeing. But in the end, though, you still want to take a, a reader in nonfiction from a place of, of not knowing or understanding to a place of knowing or understanding and ideally believing. Right. You've made your case, as it were. And it could be about anything. Well, what do you in think? Fiction, that... But I just want to say, that, but, but in fiction, yeah. you don't have to do that. In fiction, you have an opportunity to not necessarily conclude, wrap up, synthesize, and ensure that the argument has been made. Rather, you can indwell, as it were. You can dwell inside a universe, and you can bring people into that and recognize that if you can come out of that richer, more, or, again, taking, there's, a, there's an old, there's a Jewish saying, which is that questions unite us and answers divide us. If you can come out of fiction with a better question, let alone an answer, then, you know, then you, you've achieved something, both as a writer and as a reader. That's a, that's a journey worth making. Yeah. Well, what do you think your, your book specifically says about war? Uh, try to avoid it. I mean, you know, it sucks. It's, you know, try, you know, what am I saying about war? I mean, it's, I don't, I don't know if I'm saying a specific, again, it, uh, it, it's not, it's not thesis driven. It, it is, you, you know, there, there's, there's a, there was a, there was for a very long time, there was this in international affairs, there was the thesis that states make wars. Okay. It's an observation, not a thesis, but states make wars. But then there's the, also there's, there's the, there's the antithesis, which is not, which is really not arguing with the first point, but is rounding out the reality of it, which is that, and war makes states, right? War makes nations, war makes countries, right? And we are changed inevitably, irrevocably by by war and those things that we hold most dear and are at times prepared to uh to fight for and potentially even risk our lives for or give our lives for in some cases um are also things that may be gone tomorrow uh there is no prussia it's gone right there is no roman empire there is no holy roman empire there is no Gaul. There is no, you know, there is no Babylon. There is no, it's gone. Uh, they are gone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and to read, to read something like the Iliad, where 10 years they're on the beach trying to take back Troy and Troy is trying to defend itself against this onslaught, which is just never ending. And there's never a moment of peace and it all comes to a head, you know, and these places are now, we, can't, we literally can't find them on a map. Right. And yet the story of that, the pain of that, assume, I mean, leaving, you know, the, 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 the historians of, of, of this time period will say, yes, but it might be an amalgamation of this. And if it wasn't written by Homer, it was written by another guy named Homer. I, I know all this. But the larger point being that is that the there isn't a thesis about war to be made, but it is a recognition that what we hold true at. Uh, we hold most important one moment can suddenly be gone the next. And, but what I think every humanist writer who, who steps into war, who is not, you know, Hamas and Hezbollah and ISIS and Nazis and Stalinist communists and, and the rest of it are people who recognize that at, at base, what survives and what is meant to survive is our humanity is our shared humanity, our universal humanity. If there's anything truly worth fighting for it's the assurance that that is going to have a chance to persist so that we collectively can work throughout those differences um some of which may be long lasting some of them may be permanent but may and may even be irrevocable on an ontological level but might still be able to be met with tolerance and plurality and an understanding and going back really to the root of what tolerance means, which is that, which is, which to 
Protestants and Catholics a little while to figure out, which is that sins against God don't justify sins against man. And, and until we grasp that, until that becomes truth, the universal truth, we don't stand a chance. Well, I want to pivot real quick to a question about history. So you, you write at the end of the book um, in your acknowledgement section, you, you, you break down what was history and what was fiction. Uh, and it seemed like you, you really went out of your way to do that. Why is it important to you? Why is making that acknowledgement important? I think there's a lot, there's a lot of reasons. One of them is, one of them is a personal commitment. I'm an academic by training. I, I believe in, I believe in clarity and the, and making sure that if people are learning from me, they know what to believe and what not to, what to trust and what not to, where I source my material. Um, not to make it sound like the book is boring, but I, but, you're, but we're talking about the acknowledgement section, which I am, I'm breaking records on making a little bit longer than the usual one. It's not like thanks to my parents and my dog and my wife and God, and, you know, it's, um, I think because it's fascinating, some of the stuff I learned and I want you to know it too, but footnotes don't work in fiction. There's a Jewish thing, which is uh, coming from a basically a footnoting tradition, you know, said Rabbi so and so, said Rabbi so and so, so, and so it is not, which is not where where we're standing on other people's shoulders is an act of honor rather than trying to say no, 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 I made that up myself. I like crediting people who have better thoughts than me or from whom I learned on whose shoulders I can now stand in order to say something else. I like that. I like the continuity. I like the lines. I like knowing where things come from. Well, you know, I'm curious, I'm curious about your thoughts when it comes to contemporary World War II fiction and specifically talking about what's true and what's not. Yeah. I wonder if you, you think that authors are, or are stretching the truth maybe too much oh, sure. in, in contemporary World War II fiction. And if you think yeah. that's problematic. Well, in some ways, in some ways it is, and I don't want to start, I don't want to name names and, and get into this sort of author spat, but uh, there's, to preface, to preface my answer, I'll tell you a quick, quick story, because I also write in crime fiction as well, and I went to this crime fiction uh, event because I was invited, and it's fun to go to these things, and they're really, really nice people who write in crime fiction, I don't know why, but they're some of the least petty, most open-hearted, happy-to-help kind of people I've ever met. So I'm going there and I'm listening to two bigwigs talking about uh, uh, crime fiction, of which, like, I'm not one of them. I, I know about this stuff. I don't really know about that stuff. And and one question from the audience to, to – because uh, I was just in the audience um, – was how do you know all this stuff? You know, how do you know about all these investigative techniques and forensic techniques and, you know, did, 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 and, you know file the whatever report in order to – okay. And the guy said, um, can we make it up? Can we make it up? We just, you know, we, we make this stuff up now. And, and I really, I thought that was very, very interesting because um, he has no pretense. That it's like his fiction. It's fiction. I'm having fun. It's, it's like Pixar. There are no talking toys. Relax. Okay. You know, um, you know, it's like Guardians of the Galaxy. I don't know. I don't think that gravity thing would have worked. It's like, it's a talking tree. It's a talking tree. They establish that in the credits. It's talking tree. If you're in, if you're in. If you're out, you're out. That's fine. But talking tree is what's for dinner. Okay. And so, but I think the problem is, and I think with crime fiction, it's not a big deal because what do you what are you not learning? You know, what do you what are you learning incorrectly? Police procedure? Who cares? Okay. But if you but when when you watch a movie like Amistad or Schindler's List. Or Munich, or or you're watching a, a contemporary thing like all the light you can't see, all light you cannot see, etc. We know it is. We do not need to buy any more vowels. We know that people are getting most of their history from drama. What is my commitment? My commitment is this stuff's serious. 
This stuff is very, very, very serious. I mean, what's I'm not when to get into modern politics, but there's a war going on right now, you know, launched by Hamas, fought by Israel. The whole thing's going back and forth. We have no idea how many people are dying, but surely it's thousands and thousands and thousands because we know Hamas lies. On the other hand, Israel is bombing the hell out of them. So, you know, you, 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 it's whatever it is, it's awful. OK, I'm not whether it's necessary or not, we can discuss all day, but it's clearly awful. And we know we can watch the way that people are arguing, you know, about anything. They're about anything that involves the word, you know, Jew in it, anything. And uh, then we see what's going on. But with Palestine, Palestinians, with Hamas, with Hezbollah, with, with everything else, without getting in again into the politics, you can see the, the, the source material of the arguments that are being made if you take a moment to sort of trace it back. And a lot of it is coming from, you know, storytelling out there. And so it is, it is a cautious world where at, a, at the most basic level, if I was going to be quoted, it would go like this. You have a choice as a writer to either stay the plague or spread it. So who are you going to be? What is your role going to be in sharing or creating knowledge in this world? And what responsibility do you feel that you have in doing so? And so I believe that I have done my level best. And I think so. I have a Metzler, obviously. He's, he's your yeah. friend of mine. Sure. But it sounded to me like he has a similar commitment to I have, which is that he dwells in that universe of material. He knows much of it firsthand, but much of it as a scholar as well. And then when he enters drama, forget the nonfiction stuff, but when he enters into writing drama, he uses that universe to anchor you in the story because somehow the truth is compelling. The truth is already nuts. The truth is already dramatic. The truth is already beyond what we need to create. It's like when people say to me, you know, why don't you write crime fiction where, you know, whatever, somebody's head's been cut off and they're wearing nothing but pink socks and whatever. You know, it's like, listen, I, I know what human beings, I've studied that. I know what human beings do to each other. Whatever your diseased mind is trying to concoct as a horrible thing that you're going to use as an anchor for your crime novel, it's already been done. It's already been done. And I'm just not interested in using that as, as a tool for, for mere entertainment. Rather, I want to take the range of this of the of these challenges from from war and conflict and peace and history and whatnot and use that as a as a as a as a as a domain in which to make something visible that was previously invisible, audible that was previously inaudible, explicable, or if I'm in the mood, problematize something that you have been taking for granted this whole time. And, and at the end of that, we, we are going to end up transformed. And so I think if to go back to one of your earlier questions, I think, I think I'm at an age, I'm 53. So I'm starting to look at things that I could have been are no longer available. Right. I'm not going to be an Olympic athlete. I'm not going to be a good violin player. Right. You know, the guitars and I'm never going to get a proper bar chord on my 12 string at a certain fret. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So I'm going to just mess around with what I can. And when you begin to understand that in a certain phase of your life, then you begin to you start looking backwards on those moments that where you were changed and they are surprisingly visible from from older age and there are fewer than you think and you see those moments more clearly and you remember them so all the all the sex that you thought didn't matter turns out it did all the girlfriends or boyfriends or whatnot that you don't think left an impression on you they might have that choice that you made you can you can trace it back now to a certain moment and those things are they're important. And in, if you believe that the individual life is worth exploring, if, if events are worth recording, if you believe that it's not scripted and that we can potentially learn from each other, and that because we only have one life to live, that reading and other people's stories are the only way to live more than the one life that we have, then 
you have to decide as a writer what your commitment is going to be in making a contribution into that because ultimately the results of your work, the books, are your legacy. But I think that your your commitment as an individual becomes part of your legacy because sometimes we fail. But but knowing what we tried to do is worthy. It's worthy of life. Well, Derek, a very profound thing for us to end on today. <laughs> this has been a really uh, terrific interview. If people want to- You did a great them, job. That's why. <laughs> Thank you. Now, you did a great job. Ah. Now, if people want to stay in touch with you, um, where they, can they they check out your work? Are you on social media? I think media? they should contact you directly, you? and then they, you can send me. A, I'm, I, I'm easy to. Re- I'm not popular. Nobody knows who I am. I mean, it's you know Derek B Miller at Gmail. You know, I'm hiding there. Uh, you know, I'm on Twitter though I shouldn't be. And you know, they say, "Why do you?" Now. Uh, I know, but you know, it's because. It's because, you know, can you, it is, it is the, it's the Colosseum. It's the Rome's Colosseum. And, and the difference is all the lions and tigers are sitting in the theater watching the people slaughter each other down below. And it's like, you know, you just keep watching because you just, it's like a train wreck. How do you take your eyes off? Anyway. No, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm where where better books by which I mean mine are sold. So all the usual places, um, I'm on Twitter, send me a note. Um, I think I forgot to pay for my website. So <laughs> I think okay. they took it down. I, think I get redirected. They, they, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, Derek V. Miller, The Curse of Pietro Houdini. Um, go buy a copy, go check it out from your library. A really interesting story here in Derek. Thank you so much for your time today. It was a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, AJ, really. Thank you.